Welcome back. In the last video, we learned about big O notation and looked at how we can use it to concisely and accurately express the scalability of algorithms. In this video, we are going to take a closer look at big O notation and hopefully gain a better intuition for it. One term that I deliberately left out last time, but that you should definitely know when dealing with algorithms, is so-called time complexity. This is a term from theoretical computer science but it essentially means how much time does an algorithm take in big O notation. For example, an algorithm with quadratic time complexity has a running time of big O of n squared. Similarly, there is also the notion of space complexity. How much space does my algorithm need in big O notation? It is important to note that the space used by the input of the algorithm does not count. So for space complexity, only the extra memory required is significant. If one were to include the space for the input, every algorithm would have at least linear space complexity, since the space is always specified as a function of the input size n, and the input obviously requires exactly n amounts of space. In theory, of course, there are an infinite number of time and space complexities. However, algorithms are often divided into a few typical classes according to their time or space complexity, and the most important ones I want to show you now. Like last time, I plotted the complexities as graphs with the input size on the x-axis and the running time or memory requirements on the y-axis. I deliberately left out the axis markings because constant factors do not matter in big O notation. The simplest time complexity is big O of 1, constant running time. This is of course the best possible running time. The algorithm always takes the same amount of time no matter how large the input is. We have already seen that most simple operations like variable assignments or array accesses have exactly this running time. What may surprise you is that, for example, an algorithm for solving a classic 9x9 Sudoku puzzle also takes only constant running time. Why? Well, because the running time does not depend on the input size. The input size of a Sudoku is always the same. Only if we allow Sudokus of arbitrary size, the algorithm has no longer constant running time because the running time then again depends on the input size. I think it is easy to see that algorithms which can handle arbitrarily large inputs usually do not have constant running time, but instead require more time for longer inputs. Algorithms with constant space requirements, on the other hand, are not uncommon. For example, the algorithm from last video that finds the largest element in an array only uses constant memory. This is because apart from the input array, which remember does not count, it uses only three simple variables, n, maximum, and i. All three of these only require constant space, so indeed the algorithm has constant space complexity. A running time we haven't encountered before is logarithmic running time. When talking about algorithms, by logarithm we usually mean the binary logarithm. As a reminder, the binary logarithm of a number n indicates to what power the number 2 must be taken in order to get n. For example, the number 8 is 2 to the power of 3, therefore the binary logarithm of the number 8 is 3. If an algorithm has logarithmic running time, this means intuitively, if we double the input size, the running time only increases by a constant value. Say, for example, my algorithm takes only 1 second for an input size of 10, and 2 seconds for an input size of 20. Then it takes 3 seconds for 40 values, 4 seconds for 80 values, and so on. The running time therefore increases only very slowly. For an input size of 1 million, the algorithm would need only 18 seconds, and for 1 billion, 28 seconds. Therefore, an algorithm with logarithmic running time scales extremely well, much better than for example one with linear running time. An example of such an algorithm is known as binary search, which we will look at in the next video. Much worse than logarithmic time complexity, but in most cases still very good, is linear time complexity. Intuitively, this simply means that if my input is twice as long, my algorithm will take twice as much time. Algorithms that essentially iterate once over a list of numbers often have linear running time. We have already seen an example of such an algorithm in the last video, when we tried to find the largest value in an array. Besides linear time complexity, there is also superlinear time complexity. This usually means linear running time times logarithmic running time. This is not as easy to picture as the previous complexities. 
In essence, however, it means a bit worse than linear running time. These kinds of algorithms have very similar behavior to those with linear running time, but if the inputs are large enough, an algorithm with superlinear running time will always take longer than one with linear running time. Superlinear running time is seen very often in practice. So-called divide and conquer algorithms, for example, often have this exact running time. Concrete examples of algorithms with superlinear running time are most sorting algorithms or the so-called fast Fourier transform, perhaps one of the most important algorithms out there. We already know this one, quadratic time complexity. Intuitively, this simply means if we double the input size, the running time increases by a factor of four. Such algorithms often already take quite a long time for large inputs. Therefore, if an algorithm has quadratic running time, one should think carefully about whether there might be a faster alternative. However, there are certain problems where it is actually not possible to go faster than quadratic running time. For example, to find out the difference between two texts, meaning what you need to change to get from one text to the other, you commonly use an algorithm with quadratic running time. And if there is quadratic time complexity, there's also cubic time complexity, so n to the power of 3. If the input length doubles, the running time increases by a factor of 8. Of course, this can be continued, n to the 4, n to the 5, and so on. But the larger the exponent above n becomes, the more impractical such algorithms become. A running time with n to the power of some number is also called polynomial running time. But even less practical than polynomial time like n squared, n cubed, and so on, is this running time, 2 to the n, or exponential time complexity. This means that if the input size increases by 1, the running time doubles. Let's look again at the example that my algorithm takes one second for input size 10. If the running time is 2 to the n, the algorithm needs 2 seconds for size 11, 4 seconds for size 12, 8 seconds for size 13, and so on. At size 20, we are already at 17 minutes, at size 30 at almost 2 weeks, and at size 50 at around 35,000 years. So exponential running time increases so fast that you can really only use such algorithms for very small inputs. The problem is that it is quite easy to accidentally write a program with exponential running time. Indeed, if you simply try all possible solutions using brute force, you often end up with exponential running time. In fact, for many problems, no better algorithms than ones with exponential running time are known. There are even problems for which many experts believe that there are no better algorithms. In such cases, one often has no choice but to only solve these problems approximately, because complete solutions are then totally impractical. By the way, 2 to the n is only one example for a whole class of exponential time complexities. Similarly, there is also 3 to the n, or 4 to the n, or 1.5 to the n. But one thing these all have in common is that they are worse than any polynomial time complexity, like n, n squared, n cubed, and so on. Here I have compared polynomial running times and exponential running times. The best way to see the difference is if we switch to a logarithmic scaling. Now the values become larger by a factor of 10 for every mark on the y-axis. In this representation, you can see that polynomial running times actually curve downwards at some point, whereas exponential running times keep growing more and more. We have looked at some typical time complexities. But you might still be wondering, how do I know the running time of my algorithm in big O notation? In the last video, we have already seen two examples of how to get from a concrete running time expressed as the number of computational steps to big O notation. Here are a few more examples. Let's say an algorithm has this worst case running time. Feel free to pause the video and think about what time complexity this is in big O notation. Did you get big O of n squared? Then you are absolutely right. What about this running time? The correct answer is big O of n cubed. Because of the 1000 in front of n squared, you might have thought that n squared dominates over n cubed here. But if we write down the running time like this, it becomes clearer. Basically, we have n squared twice, once with factor 1000 and once with factor 2n. 1000 always remains the same, 
but to n we can make as large as we want by simply using larger and larger values for n. 1000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on. Therefore, 2n to the power of 3 will always dominate for large n. Which grows faster? n to the power of 2 or 2 to the power of n? We've just seen exponential running time, where the n is in the exponent, increases much faster than polynomial running time, where the n is down at the base. So 2 to the power of n is the right answer. Let's say the running time is 2 to the n plus 1. This is nothing but 2 times 2 to the n. 2 is a constant factor, so the running time is big O of 2 to the n. What about 2 to the 2n plus 1? This equals, of course, 2 times 2 to the 2n. Instead of multiplying the number 2, 2n times by itself, we can multiply it once by itself and multiply the result by itself another n times. But 2 to the 2 is nothing but 4. So we simply have 2 times 4 to the n. So the running time is big O of 4 to the n. You see that with exponential running times, you have to be careful not to get the wrong result. Which grows faster? We have a linear term and a superlinear term with n log n. The log rhythm of n increases very slowly, but it does increase and becomes arbitrarily large. This means for large n, the logarithm eventually becomes larger than 100. Therefore, the time complexity is big O of n log n. However, it should be said that n must be huge, namely about 2 to the 100. For comparison, there are about 2 to the 60 grains of sand on Earth. So for realistic input sizes, this algorithm has only linear running time. You can see that big O notation somewhat reaches its limits for functions like the logarithm, which increase extremely slowly. What if we don't have the binary logarithm, but a logarithm to another base, for example base 10? There is a simple rule to convert logarithms of a certain base into another base. So we can easily convert base 10 back to base 2. I will not show you why this works, but you can easily work out from the definition of what the logarithm is and from common properties of powers that this rule actually works. The important thing is that in this part, n doesn't appear at all. So we again have a constant factor that can be omitted in big O notation. Therefore, the logarithm to base 10 and the binary logarithm are indistinguishable in big O notation. The same is true, of course, for all logarithms, no matter which base. Therefore, you almost never write the base of a logarithm when using big O notation, because you can convert all logarithms into each other by only using constant factors. Let's focus on this running time once more. This is, of course, big O of n squared. But what if I told you that it is also big O of n cubed? If we look again at the definition of big O notation, we notice that there is a less than or equal sign. So if f of n is big O of g of n, this just means that f of n increases at most as fast as g of n. And since 2n squared plus 4n plus 19 is big O of n squared, it grows at most as fast as big O of n squared. But this means, of course, that it also grows at most as fast as big O of n cubed, which grows faster than n squared. So if big O notation means that one function grows at most as fast as another, is there also the opposite? Namely, that one function grows at least as fast as another. Yes, there is. In this case, we write f is big omega of g. If this is the definition for big O notation, you can probably already guess what the definition of big omega looks like. That's right, we just replace the less than or equal sign with a greater than or equal sign. So we can say, for example, the function 3n squared plus 5n increases at least linearly, because it increases faster, namely quadratically. Likewise, we can say that this function increases at least as fast as n log n, because it has one part that increases linearly and one that increases superlinearly. However, 2n squared plus 12, for example, is not big omega of n cubed, because it increases more slowly. Let's return to our original problem. We have realized that big O notation is not precise enough, since it only gives us an upper bound on how much the running time grows at most, 
even if in reality it does not grow that fast. With big omega notation, however, we can now also specify a lower bound and thus describe the running time more precisely. Assume that a function f is big O of g, that is, it grows at most as fast as g. Assume that the function is also omega of g, so it grows at least as fast as g. If both are true, we write f is big theta of g. This means the function f grows as fast as g, that is, at most as fast, and no faster. With big theta notation, we can now finally state precisely the running time increases quadratically, meaning not faster, for example, cubically, but also not slower, for example, linearly. So big O notation actually consists of three separate notations. Big O to give an upper bound, how quickly does some function grow at most? Big omega for a lower bound, how quickly does it grow at least? And big theta to give a tight bound, the function grows neither faster nor slower than another function. There are also other notations that you may encounter from time to time, however I will not discuss them in this video series. Finally, I would like to clear up some common misconceptions that people might have about big O notation. I hope that I could show you in this and the last video that big O notation is not just about running time. You can use it to describe the growth of arbitrary functions. But it is true that in the field of algorithms, big O notation is commonly used to describe running times or memory requirements. Just because two algorithms have the same time complexity does not mean that they must be equally efficient. Let's say two algorithms have quadratic running time, then one of them can still be 10 times as fast as the other, since constant factors like 10 are ignored in big O notation. If one algorithm has linear running time and another has quadratic running time, this does not necessarily mean that the algorithm with quadratic running time must be worse for all inputs. The only thing we know for sure is that the algorithm with linear running time will eventually outperform the algorithm with quadratic running time for large inputs. But we don't know how large the inputs have to be before that happens. So it may well be that an algorithm that has a slower time complexity is still faster in practice. This is especially true for time complexities that differ only slightly, such as linear and superlinear running time. And finally, just because an algorithm has a very poor running time in the worst case, say exponential, this does not mean that it is completely unusable. First, it may well be that it is fast enough for small inputs. And second, we're talking about the worst case running time. Perhaps the worst case does not occur at all in practice, and the algorithm is very fast in the vast majority of cases. Many problems, for example optimization problems, cannot be solved faster than exponential running time in theory. But in practice, there are algorithms that solve such problems quickly since the worst case practically never happens. Let's recap. In this video, we have looked at typical time and space complexities such as logarithmic, superlinear or exponential, and try to get an intuitive sense of what these complexities mean in practice. We did a few example calculations in big O notation. We discovered that there are other ways to specify the growth of functions besides big O notation, and that sometimes these are more appropriate. And finally, we cleared up some misconceptions about big O notation. In the next video, we will finally look at the first simple algorithm that can be very useful in practice, binary search. I will see you in the next video.